Welcome everyone to the Korea Herald Books Podcast. We're your hosts, Beth and Naomi. We are copy editors at the Korea Herald. For regular listeners of the Korea Herald Podcast, this is a special episode in which we have an in-depth conversation about works of Korean literature that have been translated into English. We will provide all the details about the works we discuss here in the show notes. Today we have a very special guest. Soje is a Korean to English translator um, with roots in Seoul and the U.S. Um, and Soje goes by the pronouns they and them. They have translated Yi So Ho's Cat Calling, Che Jin Young's To the Warm Horizon, and Yi Hem Yi's Unexpected Vanilla, which I have right here. Um, they also make Cho Gwa, a quarterly easing featuring one Korean poem and multiple English translations. Welcome to the Korea Herald Podcast Studio, Soja. How have you been doing? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I've been keeping busy translating and writing. And yeah, I saw your um, Bo Chang episode, and I'm like now scared of talking with my hands because of the thumbnail. <laughs> so I'll be, yeah. <laughs> well, it's really good to have you here, and thank you for taking the time. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about Um, your story and how you got to become a translator and got to translating um, poetry. I was an English major um, and I happened to meet sort of a legendary visiting professor of Korean literature at Cal, um, UC Berkeley, and uh, he taught all of his classes in Korean and all of the readings and um, writing assignments were also in Korean. <coughs> And it really motivated me to immerse myself in Korean literature. And I just fell in love with contemporary Korean literature that challenged my notion of what Korea is, what Koreanness means um, for me as a Korean American. And I ended up writing um, A thesis. Well, I actually wrote two theses <laughs> on the novelist Oh Jung Hee, and I found myself translating her work, the primary text as well as secondary text, for my research. Um, the normal thing to do would have been to just um, research and write about something that was already in English, but it, like. <laughs> The, the work felt really vital to me at the time for whatever reason, and it's um, led me to this path of becoming a full-time literary translator. That's really cool. And uh, we, I just want to mention for our very first episode, we actually um, discussed one of Oh Jung-hee's works, Wayfarer. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was in an anthology, and we really both enjoyed it, and we thought it was a really powerful story. So... Yeah, it's really cool that you, yeah. you know, focused a lot on her work as part of your research. Yeah. yeah. I've been actually translating myself <laughs> for yeah. a few years now uh, for a K Korean contemporary literature magazine. And um, I thought we could dive a little into your own process for when you translate. Though, of course, I know every text is different. Um, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of translating Korean to English? There's this really great Twitter thread by uh, Emily Wilson, who's the um, English translator of the um, Odyssey. And she, she said something about how one language makes distinct distinctions where another does not. And one of the examples would be like something like gender pronouns in English and Korean because English is very is a bit very binary language in terms of gender uh, whereas Korean um, oftentimes you know the subject can be dropped and there are no personal pronouns necessarily and so oftentimes when you're translating say a poem um, it the specific nouns are not um, possessed by a gender subject, but then in translation, sometimes you have to say like his eyes or you know her eyes, and you sort of have to make that distinction. And oftentimes people make, people as in translators, make assumptions based on you know um, who the author is. So if, this, if the poet is a woman, uh, then They use, you know, 
uh, she, her pronouns for the speaker of the poem, um, piece speaker of the poem, and the addressee may be, if it's a love poem, the addressee may be rendered male, but I think with um, younger translators now who are queer, um, they're more aware of the possibilities that lie in the poem itself. So, um, yeah, I think gender in translation is uh, something that many translators are grappling with. Um, another um, challenge of doing Korean to English, specifically in relation to poetry, is uh, lineation. So how um, how each po how each line ends and starts, and because Korean is a subject object verb language versus English, which is subject verb object, um, oftentimes uh, the verb can act as an element of surprise, um, and when you bring that element of surprise earlier into the sentence while translating into English, like it can kind of ruin the uh, poetic effect. So um, there are ways to sort of delay the um, entrance of the verb, but um, it might not sound as natural. So, you know, you're always sort of weighing, oh, does the naturalness of the syntax matter more than the order of the images? And that's you know up to each translator. Do you have any examples that you have at the top of your head? Oh man, that you really struggled with, like, huh? I dedicate each chogwa issue to identifying some of these um, challenges. So, um, you know, if if a title does not have a verb in it, like for example, um, issue eleven. We um, dealt with the poem Donunshi by Jeon Tae, and Donunshi does not have a verb in it, um, as Korean speakers would know. And but then it has a subject and an object. So, you know, how do translators make a <laughs> make a title when there's no verb to connect the two things? Um, so yeah, like we sort of, there are different approaches to that and you can read issue 11 <laughs> to um, see all the different, um, there are 22 translations, so you can see 22 attempts at sort of bridging that gap. Yeah, I have to say, I think translating poetry must be one of the most challenging things because it's not just about the literal meaning, but it's also about the rhythm and the tone and the, and the overall feeling that yeah. you're trying to convey, right? Um, I mean, same for prose as well, but I think with poetry, it's like very sparse. So every word or every placement counts. So really admire that you <laughs> take that on as like your um, main work. Um, cause yeah. I, yeah, cause I think you do mostly poetry. Right? Yeah, I've yeah. done a novel as well and I don't have a copy on me right now, but yes, I have done um, fiction, but yeah, I, I, I think because of Chulga, I've become sort of this poetry person. <laughs> I, I'm known as a more of a poetry person, but yeah. Um, yeah, so in general, do you have any kind of criteria for what kind of works you choose to translate? Um, is there any general themes or something that connects to works that you have translated so far? My biggest criteria is that I want to be excited by the work itself, and I want it to be something that makes me want to, like, immediately call up a friend and be like, oh my god, there's this book, like, can you please, like, can we please talk about it? And oftentimes, you know, um, when I first moved to Korea, like, my friends don't speak Korean or read Korean, so I'm like, well, the only way for me to talk about this book with my friend, with my closest friend, is for me to translate it, <laughs> which is kind of a, an extreme, <laughs> but um, yeah, I want that kind of sense of urgency um, when I when I approach the work. Mm -hmm. You've said it in an interview with Asymptote Journal back in August two, 2020 that yeah. um, you translate women writers who write about women for women and the word anni became an organic through line for uh, introducing yeah. the works at once. So, um, so even though, you know, I totally understand you go for what excites you, what gives you that initial excitement. Mm -hmm. um, if you were looking back and seeing some of the 
grander themes, would you say that there's a reason why you're drawn to women writers or mm. uh, women who write for women? I think they're just better. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, women, Korean women writers are doing really exciting work. And I'm interested in works that feel very new to me, right? Um, or works that resonate with things I've read in a new way. And I think, for example, when I read To the Warm Horizon, um, by Choi Jin Young, I hadn't seen a full length novel about a lesbian couple in Korean before. And yeah, it became the first um, queer, full length. Um, Korean queer novel to be translated into English. So that's something that I had in mind. And for poetry, it, the poetry collections that I translated as well, um, I hadn't really seen such sensual poetry in Korean before um, Unexpected Vanilla. And with Cat Calling, I hadn't seen such um, experimentations with the visual form of poetry. So yeah, I, I've always kind of picked out um, exciting elements <laughs> in mm -hmm. each work. And I think they happen to be women writers um, who uh, defy the male gaze um, in one way or another. That's really, really important for us, too. We talk about, about a lot of women writers, uh, Korean women writers in this podcast as well, because uh -huh. um, uh, and recently I had a conversation about how um, there's been a lot of international recognition as well of translated Korean works, especially by women writers. Mm -hmm. So um, and you mentioned To the Warm Horizon, which I recently read on Kindle. It was a very poignant and desolate work because, uh -huh. yeah, as you mentioned, it, it's it takes place in this apocalyptic kind of um, situation. Um, I was wondering, what drew you to this work specifically? And um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about how you first encountered this work? Yeah, um, it was the first novel that I read after moving to Korea in 2017. It felt very fateful for me because I remember very clearly um, lying in my office stall at the time and like scrolling through Twitter and there is this wonderful um, Twitter account slash organization called Bujige Chekkarpi, uh, Rainbow Bookmark. And it's an archive of queer Korean literature. And they posted about a new release called Hegajin Gozuro. And they're like, oh, it's about lesbians in the apocalypse. And I was like, what? Like, what? <laughs> like, seriously, what? And the, um, I ran to the bookstore and I was like, I need. To <laughs> to, yeah, like make sure that it, it exists, that it's real. And I read it and I, it seems so basic now that I was so excited <laughs> by the like, appearance of a lesbian couple. But um, at the time, it was um, very exciting for me. And that is how I came across the book via Twitter. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Did you literally run? <laughs> um, yes, there was some physical exertion involved. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and did you contact Jin Young directly, Che Jin Young, the, the author, um, as you were translating? Um, did you have to ask her about any choices you had to make, negotiations when you translated her work? Um, I think I'm one of the more um, communicative or and or annoying <laughs> translators. I email my poets a lot, but with my with the novels that I translate, um, I, I tend not to have that many questions because all the writing is very, you know, um, lucid and in, in, which isn't to say the poems are, you know, modeled in any way. It's just that um, there are a lot of um, uh, double entendres or sort of in intentional ambiguities in poetry that you know novels don't necessarily have. So I email poets a lot, not so much novelists, but I do remember um, 
some of my correspondence with Che Jin Young Takkonim, which was um, they were Dory and Gina, the two characters in To the Warm Horizon, wear these hats um, because it's they're in Russia and it's very cold. And I emailed her like what kind of hats they were. <laughs> And I would like, completely forgotten about that conversation. But then um, when we did an in, like a recorded interview, I think sometime two years ago um, at the launch, she brought it up again. She was like amused by the fact that I had asked, like, is it like a knitted hat or is it a wool hat? Because, you know, there was, there was a sort of like Soviet looking mm. hat. So I was wondering what kind of hats they would be wearing in the apocalypse. I'm actually interested in how long that process took, like from beginning to end, and how many revisions. And oh god, <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends not on the length of the book, but <laughs> how much time I've been allotted by the contract. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, everything is part of the <laughs> capitalist <laughs> mode of production. So um, it really depends on you know, the the contract that I, I've been given by the publisher. <laughs> yeah. And specifically about To the Warm Horizon? Um, that was actually the one that took the longest. Um, it was the first ever book that I started translating because as I told you, like, it was the um, first book I read when I got to Korea. Um, so I started in winter of 2017 and it came out um, 2021, uh, but uh, but I wasn't translating the whole time. Um, I th- I feel like I spent maybe like four months translate. You know, like doing the first draft um, when I was a student and like doing other things, and then you know I I would revise it time and time again. You know, to like pitch to publishers and yeah, and then like there's a big chunk of time where it's out of my hands, right? The editors are working on it, so. I can imagine it really must be a labor of love and dedication yeah. and sweat and blood <laughs> and tears. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. All, all of the history. <laughs> um, and you have a quarterly easing called togwa, uh-huh. um, which is taken from the Korean word for excess. Can you tell us a little bit about the origins of the e-zine and the story behind the name? Many people seem to think that, you know, there's a right way to translate, that there's one right way to translate, which is um, just simply <laughs> and patently f- untrue. And I wanted... Um, I wanted to show that that's not the case, right? And I decided to embrace that idea of access in the name itself. And I wanted a space where translators could really play with the poem um, in the space of their translation, as well as a space to deeply engage with each other's work. So... I've used various metaphors for this, but like I think of Chogo as a kind of sandbox <laughs> where people can come to play and like interact. And we, I think there's around 16 contributors um, so far for the magazine, and including yourself. Is there a lot of growing interest from other translators in joining, um, and how can translators join it? Okay, I, uh, one thing is I think Maybe you got that number from uh, the the people's page on the Cholga website. Um, but there's actually way more um, because that's the list of um, people who have contributed at least twice and wanted to be on the website. Um, for example, issue um, 11 had 22 contributors alone. So there's more than 16. And... I set up that page on the website because I wanted to provide an, an incentive for translators to, you know, um, return to Chulga and also take pride in the work they do uh, with 
and also outside of Chokka. So that's uh, probably the list of 16 that you saw. And Chokka is always open. Um, it's not a closed group. So um, yes, we are getting more contributions per issue and yeah you can just translate a, a poem and you, you you would be part of the, the choga verse as we call it how um do you decide which poem to focus on in each issue vibes <laughs> <laughs> i i just read um you know look through different books in my spare time and I sort of have a very informal catalog um, and I and I just sort of look through them and think oh you know what kinds of different interpretations can come out of this poem and I try to present different challenges for issues so yeah, like there's no exact science to it. Um, like truly just running on vibes. Um, but yeah, there is a kind of weird order inside my head. <laughs> I also really um, enjoy the commentary that you have in comparing and contrasting um, the translations by the contributors and thinking why the translator decided, for example, in your issue 11, mm -hmm. even the title itself, mm -hmm. some of people decide to translate as you poem or mm -hmm. you the poem or you poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting for me to see. Um, it, I mean, it's interesting to just read the translations, you know, side by side, but it is also really insightful with the commentary. And I really mm -hmm. enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> um. That keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about the Smoking um, Tigers Collective and how you got to join it. And Yeah, um, so Smoking Tigers, I was not there when it was founded, but I am told that um, many of the people involved um, were in Sora Kim Russell, uh, who's another translator, her translation workshop. Um, and then another group um, met at the British Summer, BCLT, British Center for Literary Translation. I want to say that's the acronym. Um, they have a summer workshop, and um, in the Korean workshop, people, yeah, really, you know, got along and wanted to workshop more translations with each other. So they form the collective now known as Smoking Tigers. And I was, um, like I'm, to this day, I'm confounded as to why I was invited <laughs> at the time, but I was graciously invited by the Anton Her. So <laughs> I, am, I am a member of Smoking Tigers to this day. Actually, Anton Her was, um, his essay was what inspired you to move to Korea to become a literary translator, right? Yeah, it was a huge part um, in me sort of mustering up the courage to make this international move. Um, he has this essay called A Lunar Sorority on Words Without Borders, where he talks about how he's not the most famous, <laughs> trans, uh, most famous queer translator of Korean literature, nor the second most famous. So his whole point is that um, there are so many you know, queer translators of Korean literature that, you know, you can't even rank them. But of course, now he's, you know, decidedly the most famous <laughs> translator of Korean literature. And big congrats to Anton. Um, yeah, so what was the question? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. It was more um, of a comment. It was, a, yeah. um, it was yeah. an observation. Yeah. 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 And out of the um, 11 issues of Chogwa so far, <laughs> It's a hard, difficult question asking you, um, <laughs> but if you could choose, which issue would be your favorite or most memorable? Mm. This is a hard question. Um, I would probably say issue 10 remains a very memorable um, issue because it was the first print issue and 
I was really nervous about <laughs> producing a print issue, even though people have been asking for it for the past couple of years, um, because um, printing anything requires money and a lot of planning in advance. And again, um, I, I need a lot of uh, friends to sort of <laughs> bully me <laughs> into doing it, frankly. And um, But I'm, I'm really glad that we now have a physical object to remember to walk by. And it was, um, it was also our first essay anthology. So Chokwa usually deals, it, it you know, exists in a digital format. Um, it deals with one Korean poem and multiple translations. But for issue 10, um, I invited previous contributors of Chokwa, um, whether they be translators or the poets that we've translated, um, as well as readers to just, you know, write. It was a very open um invitation to write about translation or write about translation in relation to Chokwa. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, it's um, the print copies are sold out, but the digital version is still available on our website. So I hope more people check it out. For listeners who are new to Korean literature or poetry, um, are there any favorite authors you would recommend? Oh, um, so my favorite authors are the people that I've translated, uh, Yemi, Isoho, and Choi Jin Young, Um But as for recommending um, other works to read, I think either the Smoking Tigers page or the Choga People page um, is a really great um, starter for exploring Korean literature and translation because it's where all the very cool, <laughs> exciting translators are. And we're seeing more and more adaptations of Korean literature, graphic novels, and webtoons into TV series and films. For example, um, School Nurse An Eun Young by Chung Se Rang, mm -hmm. whose work you have translated. And it, because it's uh, drawing attention you know, to the original works, do you see that there is increasing demand for these translations? Um, and at further adaptations. Yeah, I hope that um, there will be sort of a positive cycle between um, original Korean works and works in adaptation and also translation. I hope they feed into each other and expand, you know, existing readership and fandoms into something great. And has there been any um, interesting adaptations you've watched so far? Um, most recently, my honest answer is that uh, most recently, I haven't been, I haven't really had the emotional capacity to re to watch Korean dramas in full. So I've come across this very strange phenomena of um, highly condensed K-dramas on YouTube. So I watched a two-hour <laughs> version of um, business proposal <laughs> and um, it's based on a webtoon which I haven't read but I found it very enjoyable <laughs> no it is a 16 hour you know it is a is a big investment yeah emotionally <laughs> and and time wise as well so yeah and they you know like condense it in a way that um, it minimizes all of the like miscommunication and it's like all the sweet loving parts <laughs> Yeah, I think I watch actually even shorter ones. And oh, really? I love, like, you know, the very deadpan male narration of those, you know, uh, where he describes everything. Uh, I don't know. They're they're just funny to me. <laughs> yeah, the voice the voiceover is really funny. It, it goes like, he says it in a very, like, matter-of-fact way, and then there's all these, like, over-the-top images <laughs> that they're talking over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so um, are there any projects that you're working on or future plans that you'd like to share? Um, my biggest future plan right now is that I'm actually going to grad school for poetry, writing my own poems. Um, so I'm actually moving back to the US in these unprecedented times. Uh, feels like a very questionable life <laughs> move, but that's, um, that's something that I'm working on my own writing. And um, a really big project that I'm working on right now is with a Korean publisher called Itta. And I'm collaborating with them 
on a massive poetry anthology, and it's called Ravel Unravel, um, an anthology of Korean contemporary poetry. It features 12 Korean poets, and it's being translated into English, uh, German, French, and Japanese, and it will be published um, later next year uh, simultaneously. So there will be five versions um, of the same book. And I don't think I've seen anything quite like it before, so it's very exciting to be part of such a big project. And you mentioned, actually, they chose your translation <laughs> for the title. Yeah, yeah. It's a really big honor. <laughs> um, it's based on the Korean onomatopoeic word, juju, which can be um, translated in many different contexts. You know, you can cry in a in chuju, or you know, you can like people can be lined up chuju, or you know, different contexts. But in the specific context of the poem, where that word comes out of, it's about like a wool of thread um, in a sweater, and it's, the sweater is kind of being undone. And I thought um, a clever way to translate that and that sense of you know chuju, you know, like that kind of motion would be to um, translate it as ravel unravel. And in in my translation process, I learned that ravel and unravel actually mean the same thing, which mm -hmm. is weird because, you know, unravel you would think is the opposite of ravel, but it's the same. So I thought that was a, just like a fun linguistic quirk. So I, yeah, um, suggested ravel unravel, and then it became <laughs> the title of the anthology. <laughs> So yes. Yeah, that's really cool and we really look forward to when it comes out. Yeah. And um yeah. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming in today and sharing us uh sharing with us your experiences and your journey to translation. Uh we really enjoyed this chat with you. Um and for readers and watchers, you can find all of the links about the cool projects that's mentioned <laughs> in the YouTube description and how to get in touch with Soja. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Catch you next time, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
어, 저는 정세랑 작가님의 피프티 피플이라는 책을 추천을 드리고 싶은데 어, 이게 한국 사람들의 그런 51명의 사람들의 이야기가 이렇게 짧게 짧게 수록이 되면서 그 이야기가 결국은 뒤로 갈수록 하나씩 다 합쳐지고 모든 사람이 다 연결이 돼 있다는 내용이거든요. 근데 이게 한국 사회의 단면들을 잘 보여줄 수 있으면서도 좀 인류 보편적으로 적용될 수 있는 좀 얘기가 많아서 좀더 공통되게 공감할 수 있는 내용이지 않을까 싶어서 해외 소개에도 좋을 것 같은 내용인 것 같아요. 네. 어, 저는 은희경 작가님의 장미 이름은 장미라는 소설을 추천드리고 싶은데요. 그게 해외 뉴욕을 배경으로 한 연작 소설집인데 요즘 코로나 때문에 해외를 그렇게 자유롭게 입국할 수 없는 상황에서 읽으면 조금 더 좋을 것 같고 이제 해외라고 하면 막연하게 뉴욕, 성공적인 뉴욕커 생활을 좀 담을 거라고 생각하는데 적응을 못하는 사람들이 다들 나와가지고 한국인들이 보면 공감하고 해외에 있는 한국인들도 보시면 은 엄청 공감하실 것 같아서 추천드리고 싶어요. 저는 조예은 작가님의 칵테일 러브 좀비라는 책을 추천해드리고 싶은데 한국, 해외는 모르겠는데 한국 속에서 일어나고 있는 비일상 속의 부조리, 일상 속의 부조리를 굉장히 섬뜩하고 유쾌하게 잘 담아내고 있다고 생각해서 해외분들도 읽어보시면 좋을 것 같다고 생각합니다.